Part of the agreement was that fresh elections would be held in 1964. Britain, which now had control of the country's constitution, ensured that these would not be conducted under the old first-past-the-post system, which had served Jagan's party well. With people of Indian origin making up two-thirds of the electorate, he had seemed set to win another outright majority. But now, under Britain's newly imposed PR system, victory for Jagan's PPP party was no longer assured. Clem Seacheron was just 13 at the time, but he can still remember how his family, long-time Jagan supporters, reacted to the news. Certainly the Indians in British Guyana were extremely, extremely depressed by this because they knew it was the end of the road, that there was no way Jagan would win the elections. London was aware that Jagan's chances of winning the next election under the PR system were greatly reduced, but there was always the chance that the ever-popular politician might yet defy the odds. Documents show that to help prevent this happening, they planned to try and split his vote by creating and funding a new Indian party. It was reported that a Muslim party might soon be formed under the leadership of Hussein Ghani. The Secretary of State said that financial encouragement should be given to Mr Ghani and no questions asked. In Lancaster House, Dr Spencer Morby showed me that document. It's dated February the 25th, 1964, and marked secret. It's a note of a meeting with the Secretary of State for the Colonies, Duncan Sands. This is the one document which proves direct British intervention in the election in order to weaken the support of the People's Progressive Party and to make sure that however strong the support is for Jagan in the election, that he doesn't have sufficient votes to form an overall majority under the new system of proportional representation. And it demonstrates that the British were involved in manipulating the electoral process where they were supposed to be neutral arbitrators in the process. The document reveals that the British plan to channel the funds to the leader of the new Muslim party, Hussein Ghani. I showed this paper to Chetty Jagan's former Attorney General, Sir Fenton Ramsahoy. I was under the belief that his finances came from the CIA. It, for the first time I read that the colonial secretary was telling his people in his office that uh, he should be financially encouraged and no questions asked. That was the first time I knew that. So the British were in this even deeper than you thought? Oh, they were in it to the neck. They were in it to the neck. After the election of 1964, the British and the Americans had wagon was ousted. Under the new PR system, the opposition People's National Congress formed a coalition government with the United Force Party. In May 1966, the new man in charge of what was now independent Guyana was Forbes Burnham, long preferred by Washington to the Marxist Jagan, but a figure much less admired in London. Forbes Burnham, Prime Minister of Guyana, the newest and 23rd member of the Commonwealth. He leads into independence the three quarters of a million... Chetty Jagan boycotted the independence ceremony and spent the next 26 years in the political wilderness. So, how did Forbes Burnham, the man who replaced him, go down with the Guyanese people? Professor Winston McGowan. In his first 10 years, he did do a lot of positive things for the country. He expanded the educational facilities. He got involved in agriculture schemes and irrigation, road building... But for 1968, he began to have a history of, of rigged elections. And a lot of us remember him for what happened in his last years. Apart from the collapse of the economy, there was said he became increasingly authoritarian. You had virtual kind of press censorship. Uh, we had massive foreign debt, and then we, we had shortages of basic food items. His last years were really a disaster for this country from almost every point of view. Some, like Sir Fenton Ramsahoy, have still to come to terms with what happened. Throughout the history, the colonial history of this country, and from the reports of every governor, they re always reported that Burnham was totally unfit to govern this country. So the Americans didn't mind that, so long as he could be used to keep Jagan out. 
and they allowed him to do whatever he liked, even if it meant the destruction of his country. And that's what hurt me most about this whole business. It's something that you, a feeling of bitterness with which you die. What about Britain and America? After all, their Machiavellian manoeuvres, did they really get what they wanted? Well, they did at first anyway, says Professor Stephen Rabe. Forbes Burnham makes an appeal to the United States and becomes supported by the United States that he will pursue pro-Western interests, that he's a supporter of the United States in terms of civil rights in the United States. He initially backs the United States in Vietnam. In fact, he's, he himself is a socialist and begins to turn independent Guyana into a socialist state. Forbes Burnham's ideological drift continued to the point where he showed open support for Cuba's Castro. That compliment was reciprocated when the communist leader honoured Burnham with a special award. The Kennedy administration might have believed that what they did was for the greater good, thwarting communism at a vital time in the Cold War. In the end, it transpired that they, with Britain's help, simply swapped one left-wing leader for another, possibly worse one. It's something of which Professor Stephen Rabe, as an American, isn't proud. I'm a veteran of the Marine Corps. I consider myself a highly patriotic American. My blood runs red, white and blue. But 